and welcome to episode 10 of the IP3 podcast. Big I'm milestone. Kevin. Big milestone. I'm yeah. Rhea. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to talk a bit about the Living Legend format. Uh, but before we jump into that, there's a few uh, new things and updates that have happened l- lately that... Um, the CC format, it's kind of been a weird transition period between yeah. draw my hitting LL, we're waiting for uh, Mist Veil spoilers, and then on top of that, to add the third layer in, we're waiting on the KO precon, which, again, we still don't even have spoilers for that, but it releases on May 5th, or May 3rd, which I believe means it's going to be legal for the last week of pro, specifically just the last week of pro quests. So we're in a triple lame duck format right now. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's really strange. I, I yeah, it's kind of uh, it's not the singular reason, but it's definitely like sapped my my desire to like brew or try and like crack the format in its current state or be like oh. Droma is gone. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's let's figure it out. Let's break it now. Because it's like interesting it's, because it's just know, a few I'm weeks. like, ooh, Droma is gone. Let's just cut our poppers and uh, <laughs> play the greediest prism you've ever seen. Which m- maybe that's a bit too greedy. We've been finding, but <laughs> it's just a definitely little, just a little. I don't know. I think we're in a brewer's paradise right now because you get to brew decks for these next two weeks of pro quests. And then KO Precon comes out, and you have to brew a new deck just for that weekend. And then Mysteria comes out, and you have to brew decks for the three new heroes and for all of your old decks to keep up with the Mysteria meta. I, I, I'm having a blast. I don't know about you. No, I, I am excited. It's just I... So, so I think I would be, I'd be more excited if I had more spoilers already. I think the fact that... Yeah, so... It, we are in this like two week period of like, and we also don't know what's going to happen after this two weeks is up. Yeah. So we're getting like two spoilers per weekend. Cause there's a battle hardened or calling every weekend until I think until Mysteria comes out. Right. Mm-hmm. And so they did the prologue page that shows like, okay, each of these events are going to get like between two and four spoilers. I think one of them at eight, and, but got to assume that. Yeah. I mean, equipment. Well, it's just <laughs> common equipment sets, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I like I liked the weekly trickle. I wish we could see just a little bit more of the marquee cards by this point in the set to like have any idea what we're doing. So we learned actually from the Living Legend page. I don't know if you saw this from the like a signature weapon page that we know the names of all three heroes signature weapons now. Yeah. It is not Harmonized Kodachi. It is not Iris of Reality. It is not Spider's Bite. That's super exciting. Don't know what they do. Sure would be great to know that. And uh based on the spoiler sheet, we're not getting three spoilers anytime soon. So I think we're in the dark for a while. Yeah, I I wouldn't be surprised if that was either they wait right because the 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 spoiler season I think is scheduled for like May 11th through the 13th, I believe. Something like that, yeah. And I would not be at all surprised. It's something they've they've done in the past uh that is like, okay, this day is ninja spoiler day. Here's your dump <laughs> of majestics and rares and the weapon for this hero. I hope we don't have to wait that long. I, I think, in particular, I think weapons are, I don't know, honestly could use more time to sort of think through how they work rather than, you know, a random, like, oh, well, here's your, you know, my head jab clone that is a something related to crouching tigers. Um, so but I'm just I'm trying we to don't really find... know. So I, I do have a, we, we'd have to speculate here, though, because we have the names. So mm-hmm. we need called shots here, Kevin. Okay, I'm in. I, on, I don't, based... I've only seen one name, so these will all be okay, blind I'm gonna, called I'm shots. Okay, I'm going to read you the names, and I need you to tell me, are these token draft weapons, or are these majestic weapons? Okay. Okay. So news, signature weapon, is Beckoning Mistblade. Uh, definitely token. Zen's signature weapon is 
tiger taming Kakara, which is like a staff, a Buddhist staff. Uh, I'm I'm a little more torn on this one, but I'm I'm gonna say token again. Okay. And then Enigma's weapon is Cosmo, Scroll of Ancestral Tapestry. It's got like a comma and an epithet, like a hero name. It's really weird. Hmm. That's, you know, maybe. All right, I think I'm. I think I'm gonna. I'm gonna pull back my my ninja call, and I okay. think I think that New gets her signature weapon as the token, okay. and I think that Zen and Enigma have theirs as uh, Majestics or what, whatever rarity allows them to not be a part of the draft environment. That. <laughs> Okay, so there's precedent for that, right? Because in Monarch, Raiden and Luminaris were Majestics. Mm -hmm. But Galaxy Black was a token, and Galaxy Black was Chain's signature right. weapon. Definitely not Dread Scythe, which was the Majestic Runeblade. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so there is precedent. And, and Tales of Aria. They had, well, so oh, they had Duskblade wow. as Majestic, Rosetta Thorn as signature, as a, as a token, token. And then yeah. flipped on its head for Oldham. Mm. Titan's Fist as the token, and then yeah, you're uh, totally right. Okay. Winter's Whale. So there's definitely so, potential precedent, even so even for Cos splitting within a single format. Mm -hmm. Cosmo definitely majestic. I think we can agree on that. I think the other two are tokens, but we will see. Yeah, I guess it. It's tough to say because I don't know what we don't have a, a staff. We don't. We don't have a ninja staff weapon. Yeah, I was about to say we have wizards. We have staffs. We don't have a physical hero staff weapon in the game to like have any idea of what what being a staff means to a weapon right like i guess we also have illusionist staffs yeah maybe man how how crazy would it be if zen zen's weapon if that kakara doesn't attack it doesn't attack it like creates oh, creates crouching tigers or, or it like modifies your tigers. Yeah, like that would maybe, be very interesting. Just like this modal thing that, that, that. Yeah, but like staffs don't do things by themselves in the game. But that might just be wizard and illusionist shenanigans. True. I so my if you if I was pressed, I think my theory across all three of these is that we will see some sort of like normal attack action option, and then an alternative. That you can only pay for with chi the idea being that like you have an alternative outlet if you draw two chi cards late in the game oh that's that makes that's, a lot of that's, sense that's my theory i, I don't it, know if it's true but it could certainly fit because it's really easy i mean even just spitballing ideas about how that could work for zen mm -hmm. if if this staff can't actually attack but you can pitch to create some quantity of crouching tigers but if you zen pit, if you pitch chi you create that many and like it it anthems the crouching tigers for the turn or something that would be very good right yeah, exactly obviously no but no statements made about power level but like it's it's the kind <laughs> of design space that could certainly be toyed with mm. uh yeah so i think that's probably my biggest called shot is that okay uh i think kakara at, at least if it can attack, it attacks either a finite number of times, or it doesn't attack without chi as the pitch. Okay. Well, I guess we'll have to see. Yeah. I definitely. wonder if it's like... You can attack with it a number of times equal to the Crashing Tigers you've played this turn. But it's just something derpy. It's like two for one go again. But you can do it multiple times at a turn. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh I also I wouldn't be totally shocked if we ended up in a limited environment and they're just like here's Edge of Autumn this is your token weapon like Seems that's very just it yeah. right it's like it it will end a game on a long enough timeline it will end a game it is not crushing anybody in three turns or you know completely locking someone out singularly like Kadachi's have the potential to do well that's a bunch of discussion and it's just on card names we do actually yeah. have some spoilers from the battle harden um true kind of 
answers that were floating from LSS of just like, what are these heroes meant to do? Yes. Uh, so the first two expansion slot spoilers we received were visit the gold main estate. Uh, it's very strange looking stable, but I, you know, <laughs> decisions. look, some horses have really nice houses. That's, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, I guess so. so, so visit the gold, gold, I almost say Goldman estate, uh, visit the gold main, visit gold main estate is a, <laughs> Guardian action, three block, blue pitch, one cost. Victor specialization, create a gold token. Then if you control three or more gold, create that many might tokens. Uh, so the immediate thing to note here is it specifically says if you control three or more gold. So Aurum Aegis, the Victor specialization offhand, counts as one for this. And visit gold main estate makes one. So all this wants from you is to... Make one gold before you play it, at which point it just becomes just the best come to fight you've ever seen. Can trip to fight? <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> that's so much better. That's so much better. You have to wait for it for a turn, but as we've seen with KO and other things, sometimes being able to pass buffs across turns, look at you, agility, and might tokens, is mm -hmm. occasionally stronger than having to play them out that turn. Uh, right, like you could. I don't know what chest equipment victors tend to run, but I think I think there's a really big division between them on tectonic plating and tunic. The age old guardian dilemma. Yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, but even imagine a situation you're like, okay, I had to, I blocked out with three cards. At some point, I want a test of strength, or I want to clash with uh the golden sun or something. I've got my one extra gold token in play already. Uh, visit the gold, visit gold. I keep saying visit the, it's not, it's visit gold main estate. Uh, playing visit gold main estate off of like a tunic resource one card hand. That's really yeah. strong. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so you're passing. Cause if you your... draw red, you can arsenal it. And if you draw blue, you can pitch it to weapon. Exactly. So Ugh. you can, you either still get to just bonk with your hammer for four uh, or arsenal a juicy attack. You are getting three value out of those might tokens. And turns out that card is an action and it is victors. And so you'll draw a card. It's a. I think, I think the most interesting part of the card, honestly, is the fact that it encourages you to clash more so that you can win gold, mm -hmm. but also it is a clash with that's, that's a, deck building challenge that i appreciate in terms of like maintaining your ratios there i agree it's a very i mean I, I even thought that when when they were spoiling heavy hitters and you're looking at both of these guardian heroes and you're like okay these are guardian heroes who the best thing to do isn't you know 40 blue three blocks that are six powers mm -hmm. minimum thing they're, they're they're guardians that do rely on synergy betsy needs her wagers uh Victor needs gold generation and ideally clashing to do that gold generation. But the, but as with, you know, room blade ratios and other classes that, and, and, and I mean, look at Azalea as well. Uh, those, those ratios and the tipping points where it's like, well, at what point is the third visit gold main estate worse than another attack that reveals as a seven power for clashes? Because, Right, and, and that's... I can't answer that question, yeah. Neither can I. I don't... I Probably nobody can as of yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's... These are the kind of questions that I like being asked of us in fab deck building. Okay, well, speaking of unique fab deck building challenges, the other one is uh, the answer to kind of like the hanging question from the community. What is Olympia supposed to do? And the answer is you uh, get to double dip on all of your equipment and your weapons if you're bold enough to play parry blades. So his specialization in the expansion slot is a blue warrior action called Visit the Golden Anvil, zero cost. Action card, blocks three, good things so far. Olympia spec, of course. As an additional cost to play this, destroy X gold you control. All right, that's fine because Olympia like sneezes and five gold flies out. The, the deck makes it constantly. 
Equip X weapons and or equipment from your inventory. Which the only time we've ever seen this before is uh, Taylor, I think, right? Which is not a CC legal card. Uh, I, the concealed blade. Concealed blade does equip. From is the team, other right? yeah? But it but it that's a, that's one at a time. Right, one at a time. Just... Specifically daggers. Hey, how many gold you got? Bring it. Bring it all. The, what an absurd card. The ceiling on this card is insane. Uh, okay. So, so it, it being, So what's the ceiling? The seal okay, so the absolute ceiling. Yeah. We'll we'll just we'll pull out all the stops. Full magical Christmas land ceiling okay, is I'm ready. Is uh you started with like Courage of Blade Hold, Iron Song mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. Prized Galea, a, mm-hmm. two parry blades. Yes. And and uh, refraction, and bolters, refraction right? bolters. Yeah. So that's uh Nine, ten, Three, ten armor six, block. Nine, ten, plus 12, four on the weapons. Fourteen on the weapons. So assuming that you, you know, you got good value in armor block out of all that, and they were all destroyed, you can one card hand visit the golden anvil, and as long as you have six gold, you can equip uh, a fresh courage of blade hold or uh, grains of blood spill. I, I will say, by the way, yeah, your your fab boomer is showing because no one plays courage anymore. Grains is way better, but I, so same I, armor. The, same the, armor. The fact that you can re-equip is the only reason that in my head I'm like, there's there's a world where like running two courage of blade holds and then the third one being a grains could make sense. Ooh, oh my god. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's definitely like living the dream, right? We're Absolutely. talking about a lot of sideboard slots here because these have to be in your inventory like you still only have 80 Uh, cards yes and you still have to present 60 so yeah realistically you know no 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 one's gonna play this and be like here's 14 fresh armor right here's my other parry blades and that sort of thing it would be it would be i think the the expected uh speed or rate of this card is going to uh get you two to three equipment slots back i don't i don't think parry blade is going to end up being worth it i think that so so you can run you can run hatchets in uh in olympia obviously oh yeah uh so so you run hatchets so you have the good math on your side i think you just start with dynamo you don't you don't try and get cute running refraction bolters for that little extra value let me cut you off there, because I have a proposal here. There's one issue with this card. Does not have the words go again on it. Very true. You know how you can give it go again? <laughs> Mage, Mage Master, Master Boots. boots. <laughs> you destroy them to give this go again, and then equip your Valiant Dynamos. And you still get to have a turn. But that's a two card hand. Hear, hear me out. That's a hear two card out. hand, and needs you to e- e- either it's a two card hand or you're on tunic. No, 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 no. You made you made you pitch a blue to mage master. Play this with go again. Hatch it with go again from agility into your other hatchet. Maybe. I I I. I don't think it's real. I don't think it's, it's a real. Really either. nice idea. <laughs> I, I think I think the way to look at visit the golden anvil on turns when you're actually playing it for good enough value to justify having held it and using yeah. your whole turn on it is uh, if you are replacing at least two slots of equipment, two like mm-hmm. temper two equipment slots. Yeah, because uh, then it's a zero for four, right? Right, exactly. That at that point well, you're on, on that rates. turn cycle, yeah. right? Uh, and even though, so so. Only Braveforge Bracers can buff hatchets. Iron Song Versus doesn't interact with hatchets mm-hmm. in any productive way. But it doesn't stop you from running one copy of Iron Song Versus, having Braveforge Bracers in the sideboard, and trying to make your first visit the Golden Anvil be extra juicy, replace chest, arms, and head equipment all in one fell swoop. Yeah. I really like that Price Galea, you get to block two with it and then pay a resource to get two gold, so it like refunds itself for the re-equip. Yeah, I think and another piece. Pri- Pri- Prize Galea is the cold foils of that because it came in the armory kits where it was only two per month instead of four. 
and the oh. fact that Olympia now is no questions asked. I think this is the one that probably isn't really much up for debate. Olympia wants to run three copies of Prized Gilea, just full stop. Do you think? You think three? I think two. At, at least two. Yeah. And and because it itself funds your future visits to the Golden Anvil, maybe so. I I think it okay. could it could be worthwhile. Maybe so. Okay, I just I think the issue is you're never resolving more than one of these cards in a game, and if you are, something's run terribly wrong. That's fair. Okay. Last this is kind of like really exciting spoilers. Huh? Yeah. No. They, like these are these are great. Like. These are what I love to see in the expansion slots because they're mm-hmm. they're very interesting. They're asking and not overpowered and not just inherently cracked in half. They're asking yeah. cool deck building questions. Totally uh, agree. And the last one to touch on before we move on is your new least favorite card, I believe. I think. Okay, I, go ahead because I I think this card is incredibly overhyped go ahead uh, no I, I think it's i think it is firmly falls in okay territory but arguably the best new generic popper in battlefront bastion which they revealed to be a promo the extended art promo from somewhere i'm not sure but it is a generic attack action uh two block seven power in red three cost uh attack action that says when this Hello. defends alone Prevent the next one damage that will be dealt to you this turn. Love a good raging onslaught. It is. It is. It is a raging onslaught clone. I think that it. Uh, the 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 best lens I think to compare it to another existing card is probably Fiendal's Fighting Spirit. Yeah, I, uh, I think they're very close analogs. They're both poppers that potentially give you some extra value, right? If you mm-hmm. pop with Fiendel's Fighting Spirit and you're lower, you do still gain your point of life. Uh, Battlefront Bastion is worse on offense because it doesn't give you life gain when you or do anything when you attack with it. But I do think that Battlefront Bastion's defensive mode is pro- probably stronger. Hmm? It's it's just know, different. Because... It's it's close, but it's very different. So it it might I, not be enough stronger to make up for the fact that you don't want to yeah. play this on offense ever. I mean, there's like a few cases where it's good, right? It's fine as a popper if they have another attack afterwards, um, or like it. I don't believe it actually stops the merciful arcane ping because you order bastion trigger to prevent one. Underneath Phantasm, Phantasm triggers before Bastion resolves. Merciful goes on the stack, deals one arcane. But like it can stop a point of damage from like a second herald afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, I think the other. Act- oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. I was just. Well, I think the actually other... the <laughs> most. <laughs> Nailing it. Please go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not saying it. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so the other cool part with Bastion, Battlefront Bastion is you know one of the ways that prism tries to get around poppers is shrinking their uh shrinking the power so that they don't actually pop mm-hmm. uh so if that happens to battlefront bastion even if you defend with defended with it alone initially that one prevention is floating and if it is a seven power herald and you have a sink or a fate or another four yes four power four defense react that you can add on to it, then at that point, Battlefront Bastion was still just a three block for you, and you're still I don't know, getting getting a reasonable card's worth of value out of it. Conversely, in non-Phantasm matchups, it's a two block almost all the time, which is pretty icky. True. Um, I So I think actually the most interesting use case for this is that it one card blocks both Kodachis or both Spider's Bites. Ooh. I had not I, thought about I think, it from that perspective. I think that actually is like the most interesting part of it. And I think that might be why we're seeing it in Mysteria, presumably. Like we don't know that it's in Mysteria. I imagine it's a rare cycle in the set. Um, yeah, it definitely seems rare power level. Yeah. That's that's a really interesting point though, and I that also makes me think that if if Kakara is a majestic weapon 
maybe you know i mean maybe maybe it is kadachi's again or or i suppose mm-hmm. even into uh edge of autumn it's still fine right you still are right, i'll block the edge of autumn point and pass a point to the next card mm-hmm. um who knows yeah we'll, we'll we find might get out like mystic kadachi's right they have go again if you have a mystic card in your pitch zone or something cool. like that oh that sounds really strong <laughs> It does sound strong. Uh, but also sounds pretty cool. Uh, but that that about does it for new part of the Miss Veil vale things. Uh, still mm. plenty to speculate on because we still just don't know a ton yet. But uh, it, it certainly looks interesting. Um, my, my hope is for uh, Visit Vincent's Torture Chamber. That's what I want. Sure. That's what I want. <laughs> Visit Vincent Sorcerer. Look, if we're doing blue block three non attack actions with people's names on them that are underrepresented heroes, come on. <laughs> okay. I have no idea what it would do. Don't ask me. I have no clue. It just like makes rune chance or something, right? Probably. You, you take a damage, make some rune chance. Well, so actually, I did have a thought the other day that Vincent is the perfect home for. Uh, was it demonic tutor or imperial seal? One of those, mm-hmm. uh, j- like a, which a, which flavor of tutor do you want? Right, exactly. We're, uh, I think it's the it's it's the obvious home for a pay life get a card effect mm-hmm. somehow. I mean, out flavor wise, yeah, absolutely. It's just like imperial seal. Uh, sorry, we're talking in Magic the Gathering terms. Like, imagine like an action card that cost one without go again and just said. You lose two life, search your deck for an action card, and put it on top of your deck. And I, I think that there's a world where that is... So, so there's a few, a few cards that make that a really cool effect, potentially, okay. right? So you have, uh, from old... Sorry, this is the, the last, last we'll digress on raw speculation before we get into the main topic. This isn't even speculation. This is just you making custom cards. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So in the old, uh, was it Dimensional Gateway? It was like uh-huh. opt it's like an amount. Opt three banish a card. And then reveal the top. You can banish it if it's mm, shadow. Okay. It pings if it's rune blade. Yeah, uh, okay. So there's that like sort of top deck manipulation aspect. And then on top of that, in... That uh, the pumpkins, the jack o' lanterns, uh, card for Vincent. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not saying like pumpkins is is the greatest. It's a neat card. It's okay, but if it's like, oh, okay, well, let me play pay life, get whatever tutor the card to the top of the deck, and you can pumpkins it and then banish it and know what color it's going to be, so you can make sure you get a rune chant for it. I, it's just cool. I don't know about this. I, I think I'm in deep. I'm desperate. A playable card is. I a need. Big ask. I need some. I need something. <laughs> I need some something. Okay. Well, let's let's show Vincent. We have a much more interesting Shadow Room Blade to talk about. That's true. Uh, so main topic for today's episode is the Living Legend format. Uh, first seen back uh, in November in worlds in barcelona it was the mm-hmm. inaugural ll battle harden there uh we saw starvo take eight of eight of the top eight slots there and and also 15 of the top 16 something like that there was it was one, there was one prism in the top 16 it was it was absurd yeah <laughs> absolutely not absurd not uh, so wisely uh after that we got our first Living Legend Restriction announcement. Uh, nothing is banned in the format, but there are seven cards that are limited to one-ups now. Awakening, Channel Lake Frigid, Crippling Crush, Hypothermia, Oakenold, Starstruck, and Warmonger's Diplomacy. So basically, we have Starvo's three favorite attacks with devastating on-hits. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have the... Just kidding, I'm back in this game button of Awakening. Yep. Uh, and then the three most potent pieces of disruption in the format. At least arguably, three most potent. Uh, in Diplomacy, Hypothermia, and Channel A Frigid. Uh, 
Uh, Diplo, I can understand because it's just like yeah. a chain. You don't get to play the game button, but yep, I, I have strong opinions on the other two. I I believe that. Uh, so so with those restrictions, you know, yeah, we saw those restrictions. People are like, oh, cool. Now maybe it won't just be Motto Starbo for the rest of Forever the format. You would think that. But we and didn't see it for a while. We didn't see the format. Just, just the format months. didn't exist for a while. I mean, and not, clearly neither of us know anything about the format, right? We haven't played it recently or done well. No, no, no. no. Neither, of us, neither of us has played in both of the Living Legend format battle hardens that have ever existed. I mean, that, that sentence is half true. <laughs> Yep. Uh, so I did. I did play a Barcelona. I think I went four and two or four and three on chain. My losses were to Starvo because, of course, they were. Uh, and then I dropped and got in one of the Sagrada Familia promo events because I was like, "Ah, eh, let's do much, this." Much, much higher EV. <laughs> very, very much higher EV. Um, but I played. So I played in the LL Battle Harden in um, at the recent PT as well, and was fortunate enough to go 7-0 in the Swiss of that one. Uh, and my major takeaway from the event, well, and then classically lost in the top eight immediately after that. It it's, it's real. It's, you it's, can't go undefeated in Swiss. It does. It never ends up well. I didn't think about it. I should have just scooped to Brody and been like, fine, whatever. Yep. You take the first, Brody. Because then Brody and Fun would have had to play in the first round of top eight. Yeah. Actually, there's a weird world where Michael might not have even made it. Had I, oh. just because the way the breakers were shaking out, because huh. I, I think okay. Michael was like the only X2 that made it in or something. But but I digress. Uh, so yeah, that... Congratulations, by the way. That's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. 7-0. You. Oh. you still got it after all these... If, it felt really good. A year or two. Because <laughs> I haven't, after all these, a year or two. Yeah. <laughs> after all this six months since the last time you picked up your chain deck. Uh, which it actually it was that it was six. I hadn't actually played any paper reps of chain since Barcelona. It's just all muscle memory. Yeah. Well, it turns out I did this a lot uh, back before he was in LL. Um, but the format was cool. It was I played five different decks across seven rounds. Um, my Crazy, considering it was mono starvo before the restrictions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I played what. Two <laughs> two chains, uh, two chains, two Lexis, uh, <laughs> uh, Prism, Kano, and Phi in my seven rounds of Swiss. And then in the top eight, it was a rematch into Michael Fung. Uh, he was also on chain, and he got me that time. Um, and I want to clarify just for for viewers who don't know when when Kevin's like, oh yeah, you know, a Prism, a Lexi, some chains. We're talking about. Thano Black. We're talking about Brody Spurlock. We're talking about Michael Fun. Kevin cannot be stopped on chain. He can roll with the best of them. I need Busted Room Blades to carry me to tournament success. That's the only <laughs> thing that continuing to play chain has taught me is that mm. it's it's really truly the heart of the cards of Urser. Uh, but no, the 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 the. Tournament was fun. The games were a blast. I think I think that was the coolest. Felt like one of the coolest takeaways. I, there were no. My round one opponent forgot to put their Art of Wars in their deck. Uh, that was a fi, and, and so uh -huh. that one was the closest to a non game of the day. Mm. But even with that, so I didn't know. Even actually, they didn't realize while the game was being played that they presented fifty seven cards. And didn't have Art of Wars in there. I mean, uh, I, I think I'm okay with my opponent playing 57 if they want to not play Art of Wars. Kind of kinda where my head was at. Uh, so we, yeah, we didn't realize until after it was done uh, that those were missing. But it made more sense why he never saw them during our game. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but there were no, you know, like, obviously Chain's a very, potentially a very aggressive deck. So those games can end in, you know, four to five turns. But... Like on th those, e even the games that are like, oh, okay, this was a five or six turn game, uh, and by five or six turn, I mean each player having five to six turns, not like five mm -hmm. to six total. Uh, the turns are interesting, and the 
the the things everyone the questions everyone's asking are very real and you know Fi, Fi got some new juice recently which is is pretty powerful uh Viscera is always a terrifying deck to play against Kano Skeleta baby Ske- right Skeleta in the format Kano can just combo anyone at any time and mm-hmm. so he, he's just an ever ever present presence in that metagame even though you know, th- there's no banned Kano card that's like, oh yeah, and he's way stronger here. It's like, nope, he's still just really good here. And my um, my favorite part, uh, real Luminaris, real <laughs> Luminaris, which is still a hell of a drug. Uh, OG Prism is uh, still solid. I've probably still worst matchup is Chain, if I had to guess. Oh yeah, oh yeah, which is a problem because I think Chain is just the best deck in the format, right? Or is like the clear front runner. I think so, right? So, so obviously, it's not anywhere near the degree of no restriction Starbo, but yeah, it was it was four of the top eight. Okay, I, I thought it was three. Four is four is a little high, right? But it's possible for a format, and I, I'm and I'm not saying this is the case here, but you can have perfectly healthy formats where oh, this weekend four of this deck happen to make top eight. Oh, oh, oh let me be clear. I, I think four of top eight is fine in terms of like format health. It's not good for Prism. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. I'm incredibly biased, Kevin. You you have to know this. <laughs> just just a little, but it's okay. Uh I think honestly the, the interesting the most interesting difference between this battle hardened and the last, obviously, aside from Starvo's power level being very much reined in, mm-hmm. uh, is yeah. that Lexi was an extremely popular pick for the weekend. Mm, uh, it's okay. what Brody Spurlock was on, uh, and there were others. I played uh, Mercy. I played Mercy mm-hmm. in round two. She was also on Lexi. Yeah. Uh, Mercy and Easton were both playing Lexi. Um, I think I think the other Ascent numbers were split between Lexi and Starvo. No, Chain, sorry. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, I think Brian was maybe on Chain also. But, uh, Brian was playing Lexi. Oh, they, okay. the, the, they're all they're ranger fiends. <laughs> fair, Love fair. frost fights and arrows. Three of kind is still really busted in that format. It's three um, carrion husks. Yeah. Uh, well, so they actually the other interest the the it's not even that surprising. I wasn't the only one who did it, but balance of justice in that format is a oh, phenomenal yeah. card. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chain is Let's super just... spoiled. And gets to run Ebonfold into Wizards, but that card has text into Wizards if you don't have a good A B option there. I mean, yeah, let, let's do the rundown because it's Tome of Aetherwind for Kano and Tome of Fiendel. Mm-hmm. It's Art of War versus Chain. And it's Fi. Hmm? And, and Fi, yeah. Uh, it's Phoenix form if it's going really poorly versus Fi. <laughs> um, Herald of Erudition versus Prism. Three of a kind versus Lexi. Like the only deck it's not relevant against is Starvo, who strangely only draws one card every turn. <laughs> and and it's not Viscerai. quite greedy enough. Viscerai doesn't technically draw cards. Oh, you don't you don't you're not seeing Viscerai's Tome of the Arch Knight into my opponent's balance of justice. I did that one time, got me a battle hard in top four, and uh then I promptly got drop kicked out of worlds, so we don't register Tome of the Arch Knight anymore. <laughs> That's fair. I, yeah. Not big on high rolls myself either. Yeah. I, it, it just works versus like everything though. Mm hmm. But, but I think the, the diversity that we saw at that Battle Hardened was pretty cool. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. so Chain was four, four times in the top eight. Then there was also, um, I've got it over here, two, two Lexis, a Kano, yeah. and a Viscerai. Yep. Yeah which sounds okay. pretty reasonable. Um, yeah. There were Starvos. I think there, there were Starvos in the top 16. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the the big update there is, you know, you lose a bunch of your power attacks, but they printed Concuss, which is, I, obviously it's no Okanol, but it's still a real card yeah, with I, text. I was about to say, because I heard a lot of dooming about how, like, oh, they restricted all of Starvo's power cards, and then they printed Concuss and Command Respect, so he's still just as bad as ever. So I was really happy to see that, like, 
he's at an appropriate power level despite those cards. Because Pengrass is really strong when it's Starvo Fused. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, Fuse fuse into Concuss with Go again into a Frosty 4 with Winter's Whale, right? Like that's sort of the what what you're looking for there. But that's not a... There are turns you can look at that and be like, yeah, hit me, I'll give you a card, I'll take 12, I'll get a Frostbite, and then I'll still come back and Lexi 3 of a kind things or, mm -hmm. you know, chain power turn things. It's not, it's not the same level of devastating of like, fused dominated oak and old with go again into frosty four like it's it's just a for sure for sure order of magnitude more fair <laughs> i guess okay yeah i'll buy that it, it's not an order of magnitude numerically but in terms of fairness we we can define fairness as like a non-linear <laughs> <laughs> only the best of science here uh but yeah, so the, the, the format seemed cool. That like there's cool. plenty plenty of we, decks that I wouldn't be surprised to run into, which like I I can't help but notice there's one hero that we didn't we didn't say the name of. Icelander was in the Battle Hard in top sixteen, and I believe was in top eight contention up to up to round seven. That warms my cold frozen heart to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, so so I do think Chain's probably the best deck in the format right now. Uh, Lexi has pretty good game into Chain and into most other things. Uh, probably a little... I, I think Lexi like, ha has a winnable Chain matchup, but probably also struggles into Prism. Yeah, that matchup is weird. I think generally it's considered prism favored. I've heard some Lexis saying they've cracked it, which I could believe, but I haven't seen it yet. That's fair. And I think that's something we're just going to continue to see more of is prism and Lexi, while they technically coexisted in a format, right? Like Lexi was probably the fourth I mean, most popular like, PT1 I'm... deck, but not Lexi in its iteration that got it LL'd. Like yeah. prism versus Lexi is a new a new matchup in the format to explore potentially. Mm -hmm. um, but you can go to a battle or a living legend format event and reasonably expect to see chain Lexi Starvo prism viscerai Kano, and then uh, probably to a, a slightly lower extent, but still Briar Phi, and Icelander. Uh, which honestly, the, the fact that Icelander was in the top 16 uh, surprised me because I, I didn't think that that deck I, could survive with one CLF and one I hypothermia. Also, I'm surprised by it. I don't know how they're doing it. Uh, I, I will say the, the thing that kind of surprises me, I thought Phi was a better deck. I, I guess like Frosty 4 and Icelepsy is keeping him down, but there's so many Phi hands where like you go first. Turn zero, you arsenal a card, and then your turn one is like forty three damage. Yeah, I, the deck is still completely capable of doing that. However, in the LL format, I think we've got like th think about the amount of disruption coming out of both Lexi and Starvo. Yeah, and even I ran Cryptic Crossing and Command and Conquer in my chain deck as my sort of like early on Crypt value attacks. <laughs> Cryptic Crossing, now that's a deep cut. Cryptic Crossing is sweet, and uh -huh. one of my big moments of pride from this battle hardened was Michael Michael Fung grabbing that card, reading it, and be like, "Oh man, you broke! You deserve to win this game. That card's crazy." <laughs> <laughs> it's like pummel snatch on hit if you pitch a non attack uh, and an attack. Mm -hmm. And yeah, okay. with with chain ability and just Rosetta Thorn costing one, even when it's not not good numeric value, right? You don't want to pitch two cards to play one. If you pitch a red that you want later and then a blue into Cryptic Crossing with Go again and follow up with Rosetta Thorn, that was a three card eight with a Pummel Snatch on hit effect. But like, like it there. has to be blocked, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. It's, it, it's pretty cool. But I think there's okay. enough, enough disruption at this point that... Um, yeah, he he struggles to pull off the forty damage turn consistently mm -hmm. enough into the other decks in the format. 
Um, the two the two LL heroes that I think are still going to continue to struggle that you know you can't play in CC anymore. I think Oldham. There's not really a compelling reason to play Oldham over Starvo I, at the moment. God, I, I just wish they would ban Starvo. I just wish they would admit that Hero was a mistake. Let ev- all the other heroes have their cards back. Like you can't play, you definitely can't play Bravo in Living Legend without all of his spec cards. Tell that uh, Re- that's true. I was gonna say tell that to Campbell Grieth, but you're right. Without not the spec anymore. cards, yeah, yeah, definitely can't play old him when Starvo exists because it's just worse Starvo. And it got your arguably best attack hit. Yeah, in Oaken Old. Um, Dromai, yeah. I think also is gonna. Probably yeah. unlikely to make noise in the format. I, I think it's just too much. Exist- too many frostbites. Too many frostbites. The ex- she's able to adapt when it was like, okay, I need to be able to deal with disruption in the Lexi Icelander situation. But I think there's too many things for her to try and play around or squeeze into a deck that still wants to be, you know, ninety-five plus percent red cards. Mm-hmm. Um, and her least favorite weapon ever is back in the form of Rosetta Thorn. Uh, not to mention Luminaris, where people probably don't remember this because as bad as Dromai versus New Prism was for New Prism prior to Luminaris 3.0 being printed, Dromai against OG Prism was laughable. Because it was not, it's not good. It was a really bad good. matchup because turns out spectral shields can punch Aether Ash Wings mm. and be totally fine with it. Yeah, um, is is very good for Prism. Yeah. Um, the last the last two decks that I think could potentially have have some some intrigue in the format. Uh, okay. No no proof of it yet. This is uh, an educated guess. Um, and hopefully with more exposure to the format, maybe we'll see some interesting stuff pop up. But the Dusk Till Dawn duo, New Prism and Vincent. Both of them. I, I, okay. I, I, so, so admittedly, New Prisms would be based off the power of OG Luminaris combined with the mm-hmm. Figment's game plan. Um, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know that it's definitely true, but you know the, the Prism matchup into chain is really really bad and maybe there's something with the figments game plan that could gain some points I mean, there I, for new prism i think you i think prisma which is how i refer to new prism because it's prism awakener prisoner prism mm. advent they both start with a so you can just say prisma and it works for the young and adult i think prisma is Interesting because she can like actually race chain feasibly because of like just on hits stapled to everything you do that gain for life. Chain like needs exactly seeds of agony or to be wasting resources pitching into grass. Otherwise, Prisma just gets absurd value from Empyrean Rapture. Much better in Defy because like you can actually threaten to race them. I think better into Lexi as well. Where she's going to struggle is Starvo. Because she can't play 27 Spectra and 6 to 7 Figments and have a deck that functions in any capacity. It's just you're, you're just going to draw hands that have four no blocks in them just constantly throughout the game. Yeah. So, so it's, it's probably like a medical there. Right. About if you expect Starvo more. If you think it's not. worth, yeah, extra points into Chain Lexi, but giving up a bunch of equity into Starvo, but mm-hmm. still, uh, don't sleep on Luminaris. I saw that card's really good. Don't sleep on Luminaris. Um, but yeah, so the format's cool. It's solidly seems more open than I think most people would have expected after a single round of restrictions. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I'd like to just see the format more. Yeah, there's there's definite challenges to it, but this format was announced October of 2023, I believe, is when we got the formal announcement, uh, or in that vicinity, and that the first battle hardened with Living Legend as the format was going to be at Barcelona, and then it's aside from the restriction announcement, there wasn't 
anything until the Pro Tour Battle Hardened, Pro Tour LA Battle Hardened. And, you know, so, so those two events, right, you can look at it as snapshots and, okay, well, here's, you know, free Starvo restrictions where Starvo is just infinitely the best thing going on. And then post Starvo restrictions where other decks can also do some busted things. But I feel like I wish I wish the format would get a little more uh I mean, time to breathe is not the right term, but a little more focus or emphasis or maybe maybe the promise of slightly more more consistent events, right? Like pro players haven't had a reason to really sink their teeth in and put time into the format. Yeah, I mean we saw that with Michael Fun who was like Hey, uh, Majin Bay, can I just like borrow 80 chain cards and then won the battle hardened? But I think both him and Brody went in zero testing, just like we're free on Sunday, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I also would love to see the format like really deep dived and explored, but people won't do that unless there's incentive. I think True. battle hardened is trying to like the appropriate level for an event like this. We I don't... agree with that. Pro quests and RTN is definitely not it because I think it's unrealistic to expect just that level of competition, just like most armory players to have a living legend deck on hand. But Battle Hardens are a bit more enfranchised players. They've probably been around in the game longer. They have they have they have these game pieces lying around. But also the format can be kind of uh non-games at time. Because someone pops off with a 40 damage turn and the game is over, which I think doesn't make for the best like calling and pro tour experience. So I yeah, I just want to see more living legend battle hardens, really. Yeah, I think I think I agree with that. I think battle hardened and then formerly PTI events, now ProQuest Plus events. Terrible name. Yeah, I, do, I don't name. I don't love it. But what you know, the one day events that they couple with battle hardens, which Honestly, at a certain point, just put like back to back. But if you're gonna do them in the same day, just like do Ooh. battle hardens back to back would be sweet. Obviously, it's a bigger financial investment on LSS's behalf because they have to fund a second 2K prize pool. But it would get people to stick around more both days. And just imagine if you get to go and be like, "Cool, I'm gonna play a CC battle harden and then an LL battle harden in the same weekend." So sorry, this is gonna date when we're recording this um, live. Spoiler just dropped. There's new Spectre Shield art in Heart the Mist Veil. And it is pretty. All right, sorry. Back to the <laughs> <laughs> I can't find it. Where is it? Where is it? Hold on, hold on. I, I'm in 8 million discard, discords, so I had access to it first. Oh, I found it. It's like a, a swirling blue background. Behind it's a, a blue tarot card looking. It's thing. like a talisman, I think, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's neat. I don't think I like it as much as the OG, but it certainly fits with this set. Very I, well. I like that the yeah, I like that it flavor fits better. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um Okay. Back cool. on topic. Back on topic. <laughs> back on topic. Uh so uh, other things that I'd like to see with the format. Uh, so, so I do, you know, more, some more events, a bit more coverage, a little more consistent emphasis on it so that it's not, a, oh, well, there's this thing every six months attached to one of the PTs or worlds. So I guess I'll have the deck built, but like, you know, no one, no one's, most people aren't putting, I won't say no one, most people aren't putting big dedicated testing time into Living Legend when, you know, the real goal of the weekend is, the CC and draft pro tour or the mono constructed calling events uh, just hasn't been in a position to really get, get its own attention. And I would love to see that change a bit. To be honest, I think one of the reasons, the biggest reasons I want to see coverage of living legend battle hardens is because these are the decks that people know the best in the game. There are, more chain masters than any other deck masters, I would argue. 
in the game. People are super nostalgic for Starvo, which is so bizarre to say, because I everyone hated that deck while it was legal. People are even more nostalgic for Lexi, which is even weirder, because everyone hated that deck when it was legal. <laughs> I, it just feels like a slam dunk to like show this to people, like, hey, look, th this is all the cool stuff, remember? And look at how good at it these people are. It, it, I think it would be immensely popular to watch as a viewer. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the, the, the potential on watching this format is super high. And you're right, there are some games where you're like, all right, this was kind of a non-game. But that's what, what the backup match is for. Right. Well, and you look at, you know, the, the easy other game analog is the legacy or vintage Magic the Gathering formats that are, these are all the cards forever and they're legal. You can do the most busted things here. And people still love that format, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. I'm a, I'm a lands player and this person just sneak and showed an Emrakul and killed me on turn two. Sometimes it happens. That's just part of the game. You have bad matchups. To our non-Magic Fab viewers, I'm very sorry because all of those words were real words, but I'm sure they I made no sense to you. Mostly understood what was just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, non-games, while they generally happen to a slightly lesser extent in the CC format, they still happen. It's just, it's part of the game. Uh, but I don't, I don't feel like they're especially with Starvo toned down, I don't feel like they are quite as non-gamey as some mm -hmm. people seem to think. Um, I do think there are a couple potential changes that I'd maybe like to see. Uh, so okay. obviously the sample size I... of one subsequent event isn't huge. And... No, 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 no. You are the premier like leading expert in the world on Living Legend. <laughs> yeah. Which, like, I... <laughs> I say that as a joke, but like it's probably not that far off. That's fair. I have written a couple articles on it and played in the two events of it that there have been, but and done well. Yeah. Uh, I think there's probably a reasonable argument to restrict Art of War in the format. Love it. Uh, I think it's sort of the value is twofold. It keeps with the We'd really like to not actually have to ban cards here, which obviously mm -hmm. with restricting seven things instead of banning anything seems to be something that they want to strive for for LL. Uh, it tones down some of Chain's most disgusting turns and the and the, the sort of standard power level of his aggro game plan prior to like setting up a late game with you know the, the final shackles sort of thing. Um, so it sort of reigns in the aggro plan there a little bit. I mean, if if it's restricted, I think on average he doesn't even draw it in the game. It's more likely he banishes it, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it basically becomes 50, 50. your other soul reaping, right? So <laughs> right now, soul reaping's your point of that. You're like, I'd love to see this in every game because this card's insane. Uh, and you just, you know, it it's just a little, it's taken a little off the top, which I think is entirely reasonable for, to do with a deck like Chain that has such a uh, inevitable late game, if the deck mm -hmm. is being pitched and played as you usually want to, um, I think I think kind of interestingly, if you restrict Art of War, Balance of Justice is not a slam dunk anymore. It's like actually a strategic medical of will this be more value than Crown of Providence, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, that. And to the for from a format perspective, seems like upside to me. Yeah. Uh, and then you've also got Phi, who Art of War is probably a big part of most of the most degenerate Phi turns. Mm -hmm. um, which, so, you know, hitting that does, doesn't not, seem like yeah. a huge downside to me. If not literally all of the degenerate Phi turns. I guess they can step you without Art of War, but it's not nearly as good. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, so I think I think that is if they I, I don't think they're going to take action after this last battle hardened. No, if there think, is further action in the sense of restricting more cards, I think that's the only next thing to possibly hit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, on the flip side, something that we we chatted about just before this episode started, and I think I agree with you. I think they you could unrestrict. Massacred. 
They massacred my girl for Starvo's sins. It's so true. It's so true. It's it's just like objectively true. The restricted CLF and hypothermia? Come on, both of them? And because you're too afraid of Winter's Whale? And Warmonger's Diplomacy, yeah. Right. Which like she was the best user of Warmonger's Diplomacy. Yep. I think I, I give me give me one of those back. Give me CLF back. I think I think CLF is easily the most reasonable to send back into the thing, right? Like it doesn't CLF is a good card. It can steal full turn cycles, but you you can deck build around it a lot mm -hmm. better. And it's natural predator from back in the day of yep. five versus Icelander versus Oldham. Was that the that was the little that triangle? Uh, uh, Belittle. Belittle's already in the format. Mm -hmm. Chain's running it. Eyes running it. Uh, Briar could run it. Here's my Here's my other argument for CLF, by the way, which is, so yes, Starvo gets an ice blue three block for Winter's Whale, but he does not have enough ice cards to play CLF and resolve it, and it ever lasts for like maybe more than one turn cycle. And Lexi certainly does not. Hers, her ice cards are like red Arctic incarceration. Is she really going to pitch that? Yeah. Mm -mm. Well, and I, like CLF wasn't... So CLF into a huge chain pop-off turn is a problem for chain. Obviously, yep. that's the whole point of the card. That's it's just it doing its job. Point, yes. <laughs> I think it's it's tougher to play around, uh, or or like the card that I'm more or has screwed up more of my chain turn cycles is probably Blizzard compared to mm. CLF. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's just Did you get to be surgical with it, especially yeah. especially out of Icelander. Where it's a three tax instead of a two, which is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think unrestricting CLF would be a reasonable move. I, I, I don't, I don't think it would like break the format in half. I think you, you do give Icelander a little boost. Obviously, it gives Lexi another little boost. Um, maybe that ends up being too much. I do think that Lexi is the yeah, reason just... CLF got restricted but... in the first place. We'll just restrict three of a kind. Like yeah. if we want to talk about like restriction worthy cards, three of a kind is definitely in the running. I agree. It's uh I just lost I lost our magic equivalent. What's the draw three? Ancestral recall. Ancestral recall. It's only like the second Look, most famous magic card. I don't play blue cards. I don't. I don't play blue cards. <laughs> this is what happens when you have a Jund Mage and an Esper Mage together <laughs> make a podcast together. <laughs> uh, it's a hilarious disaster. Uh, but but yeah, so I, so I think restricting Art of War, unrestricting CLF, I think are the two most likely next potential changes to the format I could see. I don't think there's any real impetus from the Battle Harden to you know make that move on either of them immediately, but you know, it, it, that just both of those seem pretty reasonable potentially. Um, so we we touched on this challenge before, and I, and it's something that I agree with you is definitely a challenge that you know the majority of the current player base doesn't just have a living legend deck lying around. Most I, of the current I, player I don't base, even. yeah, most of the current I, player I, base wasn't playing during PT one. I would wager, like the actual just brunt of the current active players. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so those aren't just laying around, and it's a tougher sell to get people to want to build that for a format that sees relatively little action, right? If you want to that... play an obscure format, yeah. you can play commoner, you can play our commons and rares melee format that we've talked about a little bit, you can go and play clash, which is sort of somewhere in between commoner and uh, melee, like they're they're UPF. You can homebrew PVE things. Like, there's plenty of options to do for off the beaten path gameplay. Yeah. Um, that was that honestly was my issue with it. When I was prepping for LA, I was like, okay, I've got my deck locked in for the Pro Tour, obviously. Same deck for the Calling. Am I really going to sit here for two hours and figure out a list for a Battle Harden with the format that who knows when I'll play it again next time? And dig out all these cards, and I convinced myself to I, like I. These are probably enough to turn Prism into a living legend deck. 
but I don't know. It's it would just be thrown together. Okay, this looks like the analog of my old list plus a handful of very obvious yeah. upgrades or additions, right? Phantasmal symbiosis and you know a, a, a smattering of other things. But yeah, there's just there isn't without that consistent source of competitive or casual play. Mm-hmm. It's just it's tough to want people to do it, which. It's like the Ouroboros, right? If people don't want to do it, it's tough to justify putting the competitive stuff in place. But like, you sort of got to give a little to get a little. Uh, but I think I think there is a solution here. I think I, there's actually two really interesting ideas to All right. invigorate the LL format. Sell me on them. I got investor money to. <laughs> okay, so the first one is just taking an idea that they've already implemented for CC. And doing it for Living Legend as well. Okay. Living Legend pre-con decks. Okay. The decks, the decks build themselves. It's really easy. So, so, so I think I think the marketing is probably easy. And your first three that you should just release all at the same time, they practically build themselves. They are the game's marquee, like OG overpowered heroes in Starbo Chain and Prism. Yeah. Uh, you could you could make these pre how, oh. how do you reprint equity these? Is it like white border ugly cards? So that people don't get upset that like they're I don't know. Um there's I think... some stupid majestic is getting reprinted. That's a good question. And one that it's really just up to LSS to answer, right? Like they could mm-hmm. They could make them white border and cheap. They could make them black border and juice to the gills, but correspondingly a bit more expensive, right? Like these aren't going to be your $40 KO precon. Um, they could use this as an opportunity to print some other neat new options for those, uh, you know, class and um, talent combinations. Mm-hmm. Um, realistically, I think the the path of le- not, not the path of least resistance. I think you probably just make the decks very solid and affordable. Put a few new intriguing pieces of equipment that aren't going to break new the format, but end up as that. cool. They could end up as cool sideboard slots, right? Kind of like okay. Savage Sash, like how they're doing for the KO precon. Um. So I, I think they can sort of split the difference, right? Mm. Chain can have Snapdragon Scalers, and you can run that card, and you don't have to feel embarrassed about it. You ran that for years prior to Creepers being printed, and there are still games yeah, I, where I guess, Scalers I are just Chain's better. actually really easy to do, because it's just like Snaps, Aether Ironweave, Vexing Quill Hand, Ebonfold, and it's like there's no yeah. fridge there, but all of those are very reasonable to play in Chain individually. What's what's stopping them from giving me a reprint of non-foil regular old black border Skeleta instead of oh yeah no, yeah great, like there's great point yeah. yeah plenty plenty of of neat options for you know okay. potential reprints okay. there. You're you're selling me here, and, and I think you know these are probably decks that end up being in the sixty to seventy five dollar range versus Ko being a forty dollar precon, but yeah. Look, I, I think I would do that. I own zero chain cards. If you gave me like a chain 60 and then like, you know, not the perfect equipment suite, but a good enough one, I think I would buy that for 70 bucks and just be like, all right, I just slot in my legendaries and I'm good to go. Yeah. So I, I think that would be huge. Right. And it, and it's easy to sort of, you can tie, tie this in with some other efforts to like get some more eyes and attention on the mm-hmm. format. Announce your first ever living legend calling. Put that somewhere. Uh, maybe it's it's tough. It, it's definitely a tough sell because there's definitely a bigger risk to an LL calling compared to a battle hardened at yeah. PT weekend when you know the calling's already going to get plenty of attention. Mm. Um, but but hype it up and put the emphasis on making it accessible. If you get these precons, you are you know. 80% of the way to having a deck that you can bring here and just feel entirely confident about playing it into this LL field. Um, and, and so you, you release LL precons. Maybe you do a skirmish season that has LL as one of the formats, potentially, along with these precon releases. Okay. 
Yeah, and then, I can see that. And then a few weeks after that LL skirmish season, you're like, hey, first ever LL calling. Come on, who wants to cast some seeds of agony? Uh, I, so, so I think it's a something that would take a concerted push from multiple angles, but it seem it definitely seems doable. The other one that I think is a slightly smaller impact, but it's just cool that you know LSS on average is pretty good about not forgetting about the little guy for the most part. You know they they know that room blades are due for some new new stuffs pretty soon. But like <coughs> Rip Teclavosin. Rip Teclavosin. No, actually, I, Jesse's been doing some scary stuff with that deck lately. Uh, but how about expansion slots for LL Heroes? Yeah. What, what about a new Oldham specialization card that's like, hey, this this is a reason to run Oldham and not Starvo. Oh, Northern Winds. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to keep a straight face. Uh. Yeah, I that... mean that functionally was an expansion slot card because when it came out, it was not legal in old. <laughs> yeah, old him was not legal. <laughs> yeah, so no, there's precedent. You're totally right, Kevin. It's a yeah. great idea. It's, it <laughs> it's a great idea because it's happened already. Uh, but I, like putting it in the expansion slot is a mm. it's relatively inoffensive. It's a way to balance right. So they don't necessarily want every expansion slot to be pinnacle of playability but it's a way to put a card that's play very playable but still niche because it's okay you know the same way these new visit the xyz locations are it's like well mm -hmm. if i don't play victor i don't really want this if i don't play olympia i don't want this if i'm not playing uh oldham and living legend i don't really want this but some people want to play oldham and living legend and you know giving giving some some bumps to some retired heroes that you know could use it in the format seems uh, like a bit of I a free roll. I liked the idea. I think that the expectation of what the expansion slot is is kind of solidified at this point. I think if you did this, it would need to be in almost a separate card slot, like in addition to expansion slot. Still, like physically in the token slot, but you probably don't want this replacing one of your two expansion slot cards in your booster box because it's a much less likely chance that you play this LL hero compared to uh, you know an evil magneto or whatever it's an awful example a visit right. golden anvil fair fair <laughs> it, well and there's there's a couple like levers to be turned there right it could be short printed within the expansion slot at least in the non foil yeah, versions um, mm -hmm. or you know, maybe maybe they are at some point they're like, hey, we know eventually we're gonna want to bring Oldham back to CC instead of LL. Like if you print something and you're like, hey, this is the design that is cool, it seems reasonable for constructed, we'd have a hard time ever printing it in a set where you could play this in a limited format. Like there's it's just a, an extra oh avenue God. for that. The the storytelling opportunity there is actually really cool. Cause like imagine if Viscerai Imagine if Viscerai had LL'd with Skeleta. And then we get this expansion slot card that's like the quest the vast beyond. We're like, what's going on with this Viscerai expansion specialization? And then yeah. you get Sonata Phantasmia, and we're like, what is Viscerai doing? And then he comes back in the next set, and it's like, oh my god. Okay. I, I'm I just sold myself just on for like the the flavor reasons alone. I'm so in. It's a cool, it's it's a cool idea. And the the sky is the sky's the limit for what they how, how deep they I, want to I, go. I think this is a really, really, of it. really cool idea now. All right. You heard it here first, LSS. Maybe not. You probably already had all these ideas. I wish they're nothing I, crazy. <laughs> I uh, can't wait for this weekend when it happens and a chain specialization is revealed as a spoiler in the Mysteria <laughs> expansion slot. Accidental called shot. Let's go. <laughs> um, but yeah, long story short, LL is a pretty cool format. It's not the most approachable. But nope. there's like serious long term potential to it. I think, uh, I think it just it it needs some specific attention in TLC uh, from LSS from a competitive play standpoint to you know to get eyes on it and to get it to where where I assume they want it to be long term, which is eventually the you know the eternal format of flesh and blood. Yeah. Um, we're not quite there yet, but I think we're on our way. We're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Eight, eight LL heroes, six of them reasonably viable within the format at the moment. 
Um, and I don't know. I, I think it's going to be interesting the next time we v- revisit some of these classes that are inherently powerful, mm-hmm. uh, like Rune Blade, maybe even Enigma, right? And see, oh, I guess may- maybe a little less so with Illusionist because it's so much of what makes them good in this format is Luminaris. Um, I but... did I show you by the way? Um, and th- this is kind of a throwback because I promise this card is actually playable in Living Legend, even though people think it's a joke. But uh, speaking of Enigma, sorry, we said we said the name, so I got to show off the new fancy extended art code foil. I <laughs> promise this card is playable. Diadem of Dream State, Ponder tokens are broken. It's like unironically good in Prism and Living Legend. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm gonna have to chew on that one or pick your brain okay. about it later. That that that's one that we can leave our audience thinking about until next time as well. I promise that card is good. <laughs> Ponders, ponders are pretty strong. Uh, all right, well, that's enough of this living legend ramble and discussion. Um, I, I had just, I was getting ready to start my thesis on why twenty-seven spectra are the best thing you can be doing in the format. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the best thing you can be doing in the format if you want to lose to chain every time. <laughs> okay, well, all right, Mister Time Snap Potion. Hey, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> all right, well. As always, thanks for hanging out. If you enjoyed this episode, like, follow, subscribe, all the fun stuff. Do it if you want to. You don't have to. Uh, Got to keep that spirit alive for Alex. Don't do it if you don't want to. Yeah. That's okay. We appreciate it. Um, we'll, uh, we'll be back in another couple weeks with another episode. Uh, and until then, this is the IP3 signing off. See ya. See ya.